This video is part of a six-part video series on creating a landing page from scratch. So in case you haven't already, be sure to check out the other parts of the series as well. Thanks a lot for tuning in. I hope you will enjoy the following video. Okay, so I iterated a bit more on the header image and I think I found a quite nice way. I adjusted the sizes of the bubbles a bit more and made some minor adjustments to the typography. And I think now's the time to move on to the next section, uh, which would be the slider element from the initial wireframe. By doing that, um, we will establish a new um, typography size because now we have the first size, which would, would be the headline number one. And since this would be too big here, we will incorporate uh, another size. I think I will try out 50 or 60, something like that. And we will for now call it popular destinations. And underneath it, we could also um, maybe add some of this description text here. And when, you, when choosing a color on the white background, I think I would also suggest to use uh, our primary color as a font color instead of a complete uh, black because it also adds some more brand character to it, to it. So now we can start working on the slider element. For this, I will toggle the layered grid we created before by clicking Ctrl and G. And then I can start dragging rectangles by clicking on R. And I think we could try using um, four columns for each slider element. Or we could even try out three maybe. Yeah, I think that would work uh, quite well. Then we can use a fourth, fourth one here as well. Okay, and I think we can go with a layout like this. And the first thing we need again here is images. And I already researched some of those. And I will paste these here. And we will proceed in the same way as before. We can click on the rectangle, then we paste the specific image above it. We click on the rectangle and click on use as mask. And then we can group the element so that the rectangles above it are not affected by the masking effect. And we can basically proceed this way for all images. Okay, so now that we added uh, all of the images here, we can also think about the proportions of the slider. And when I click on one element here, we can see that the width of three columns is 277 pixels. And since that's not too far away from the current height of 241, I think a square format could fit these images quite well. So we will select with command all of the rectangles here and we will adjust uh, the height to the same um, size of the width so that we have squares here now. Okay, great. Um, now we can think about the title and I think what I would like to list here is basically the specific destination, so the country, and also the specific location in this country. And we can visualize this with a white um, solid color overlay, for example, maybe like this. We could add a typography here. We could, for example, use this typography from, from before again. I think what would work quite well, because we were talking here about a text overlay, would be a colored background color. And we can achieve that by clicking again on R and creating a rectangle. And then clicking on the fill here and selecting 
the subtle brand color we defined earlier. And in order to move this back, we can either select all of those, Command X and Command V, then it's here in the front. Or we could also right click and move it upwards or backwards this way. So another thing I would like to add here, we said we will use this for the country, for example, Mexico, and we can use a subtitle here and we could use the font size from the button from before and we could add a specific place in Mexico and then we can align it. Um, I usually align all of these elements by clicking on shift and then pressing the arrow keys and I try to keep a spacing that is similar throughout the whole design. So for example, I try uh, to use 20 pixels for very small spacings, then uh, double it for bigger spacings, so 40 pixels for bigger ones, and then double it again, 80 pixels for even bigger ones. And this way I can always use 20, 40, 80, and so on. Or for another design where I think I need a narrower spacing, I can also use uh, 10, 30, 60, or I can use even bigger ones starting with 50, 100, 150. So I think it doesn't really matter uh, which spacings you use as long as they are consistent throughout the whole design. And it's also not so important in the initial state of the design to keep them consistent. We can play around with all of the different uh, spacings, but especially once you are created the whole uh, first draft of your design, I would definitely go over the design again and maybe remove some uh, font weights you don't really need, um, adjust some spacings here and there to make the overall look uh, more cohesive. And what I'm trying here is, I'm trying to adjust the spacing so that we have an equal spacing uh, on all sides. And I do that by moving the element with shift and the arrow keys. And I adjust the width of the element by clicking on command, shift and the arrow keys. This way I can adjust the size here and I can basically adjust the size to my font here. And then I can click three times on the shift icon so I know that it's exactly 30 pixels. And now we created this element, we can group it again and we can use it for all of our elements here. So I think that's quite interesting already. Uh, the next thing we could think about is a pagination or a slider element. Um, so for us in order to do that, I think we can duplicate these elements here and we can fade them out so that we can indicate uh, to the user that um, this is a slider element. And one more thing we can do now is uh, we can create control elements for the slider. Um, and I usually prefer to use both uh, bullet points and arrows. So since it's a very circular design we can probably use um, a circular element here again. So I will just create a circle with the size of, I don't know, 50 pixels for example. I will create another circle here. I duplicated the circle by pressing option and just dragging the bubble here around. This way I can duplicate elements very quickly. And afterwards I want to paste a arrow icon here. If you're looking for a free source of icons, I can definitely recommend iconmonster.com. You can just type in a random name here, for example, arrow, and then you get a selection of free icons for you to use. For this design, I think I would prefer to use fin icons and we will directly select one of these arrow icons here and we're gonna download them. And once I downloaded it, I can again drag and drop it into my design. I will adjust the color to white and I will tilt it into the other direction. And one more thing that I can do at this point is 
I can adjust its size by clicking again on K, the scale tool, and making it a bit smaller. And I think it also makes sense to adjust the thickness of the arrow a bit so that it matches the font size better. And I can easily do that by adding a stroke to the arrow icon and clicking here on outside. And I think 0 0.5 would be not that bad. And I can also click after that on object and then outline stroke so that this stroke is converted to a actual shape element. Then I have two layers here. One is called vector, one is called vector stroke. And in order to make them one single element again, I can click here on the union selection icon in this way. I just created a new arrow with a bigger thickness without any special stroke properties. And this way it's easier to uh, change this icon and work with it later on. Center this element again. And after that I can create a group again. I can copy it and I can mirror it. Good, the next thing would be the controls in the middle that indicate the amount of elements that are inside the slider. And I think I would also like to create this element with um, circles. And there's probably one element that is a bit bigger than the other. So we could make this one 20 pixels, for example, and the other one's 15. And I will now go for an equal number. So I will go for one active element and for four inactive elements like this. And the active element could be highlighted. We could make this white, for example, and then we can duplicate the circle and make the duplicate a bit smaller and fill it with our primary color, the dark blue. And we can add a drop shadow to the bigger white circle in the background to make it pop out a little bit more. I can adjust the blur setting here and we will just play around with it a bit until we think it's, it looks nice. I think uh, with the drop shadows in general, it is wise to not overdo it. It also adds some nice depth to the design and helps alleviating certain design elements to the user. So if used in a moderate way, I think it's a, a nice way to highlight elements. Yeah, and I think that looks quite decent. We can maybe even make it a little bit bigger like this. And for the other elements that are inactive, we can also select the main brand color with the color pick icon. And by clicking on a number from the numpad, we can adjust the opacity. And I think I will set it to 10% opacity. It looks inactive, but it's still visible to the user. And since we selected an active element here, I think we should maybe also think about an active state. And one thing that I had in mind before is, is that the active element or the highlighted element here is always bigger than the others. So uh, we can try to rearrange our layout a bit. For example, the active element could be half of the grid size, so six columns, and the other elements are then only three columns big, like this. This way we add some emphasis to a specific element and we can uh, showcase different images as well. To add some more purpose to the highlighted element, we could also add, um, for example, some more details like a rating here on top. How good is that destination actually? Uh, how many stars did the, um, did the guests give to this specific destination? Yeah, and if we would like, to, we can work here with, with any sort of rating mechanism. Um, for example, as I already mentioned, we could use a star element. Uh, for this purpose, we can use um, Icon Monster again. And there are already different sorts of stars. For example, a completely filled one, a half filled one or an empty one. Um, for this purpose, we will go with both the filled one and the half filled one. And once I downloaded those, I will jump back 
into my Figma design. I will paste them into my design and I can adjust them here again. I think in general it makes sense to add a different color to the stars. I think a yellow or orange tone is quite common for these sort of icons. Maybe something like this. It's also quite common to add around five stars here. And I always try to keep a equal spacing between the different elements and we can adjust it later on as well if we do not hit it perfectly. So once I have here five stars I can click on distribute horizontally and then they will be aligned in the right way. I can then click on command G again to group them, click on the scale tool and make them a little bit smaller so that they fit into this element. And we could also add a number, for example, how well this was rated and also decrease the opacity a little bit so that it's not, not that prominent. We could also add a divider by clicking on L. We can actually create a line here and making this line a little bit smaller through the stroke panel and then also adjusting the opacity. Yeah, and I basically apply very similar concepts than I did before. I try to have a similar spacing here between the rating and the stars and also between the margin outside on, on the left and on the right. That looks quite um, decent actually. One more thing that we could add as well is a call to action. So these are maybe only the most important popular destinations, the five most important ones, but we could add a call to action so that the user can uh, open a separate landing page listing all popular destinations. So we could create a call to action here stating view all destinations. We could maybe also add some additional element to the button so that it looks a bit more branded and not too standard. I think that looks quite decent. And once we did that, uh, we can align it. It wouldn't be a bad idea to align it on the right because users are used from uh, tons of e-commerce platforms and other tools that their checkout is always on the top right. So this is a behavior we can also use to our advantage here. And we can align it here with the baseline of this subheadline. Yeah, and I think that's actually already a pretty decent slider element. So I made some minor changes to the popular destination section. I decided that it might make sense to add the drop shadow to the stars back again, but adding also a small stroke to emphasize the active stars more and have a bigger differentiation between the active ones and the inactive ones and instead of adding here a vertical rule I added a gray background color and despite that I added some very subtle wave texture in the background to add some more brand feeling to this section. I put the arrows uh, back to the images here and faded out the images on the uh, side so that it's a bit more clear how the user can interact with the slider element. This video is part of a six part video series on creating a landing page from scratch. So in case you haven't already, be sure to check out the other parts of the series as well. Thanks a lot for watching this video.